Hello, I'm Dr. Deepak Bhatt for ACC.org, reporting virtually from Amsterdam, where the European Society of Cardiology has been going on now. This is day two coverage, and we'll talk about some of the trials. I'm very lucky to have my close friend and colleague, Professor Gabriel Steg here. Hello, Gabriel. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. And, you know, I'm not actually sure. Are you literally in Amsterdam or are you in Paris right now? I'm neither in Amsterdam nor in Paris. I'm in Provence, in the south of France. It's a wonderful sun out there. Oh, my God. Are you on vacation now? Yes. Oh, well, ACC sort of. org <laughs> owes you big time. I didn't realize it was your vacation. I, of course, you know, I, it's that time of year in August and uh, in France and Europe. Well, thank you for doing this. Since you're here, I'm going to put you to work. Can you tell the audience about MasterDapt? Uh, in a nutshell, what is it and what did it find? What does it mean for clinical practice? Yeah, it's a large, um, um, broad trial uh, enrolling uh, 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 the full spectrum of patients undergoing PCI to, to continue to explore uh, the question of the du optimal duration of DAPT post-PCI, specifically in a population at high bleeding risk. And they, the patients were uh, enrolled one month post-PCI, and they were randomly assigned to either stop or continue DAPT at one month post-PCI. And what's interesting is that the population that they enrolled included patients with and without oral anticoagulation as background therapy, uh, all, all sorts of types of, uh, of patients otherwise. And they looked at a, a, a whole gamut of outcomes. But the bottom line is the short abbreviated course of therapy, stopping at one month, reduced bleeding, and was non-inferior for net adverse clinical outcomes or ischemic outcomes. So it seems to complement and confirm uh, previous smaller studies. This one was a pretty large study, 4,400 4, patients, uh, uh, but also in a broad population, so quite robust evidence. Yeah, no, I, I think it's adding to the wealth of data that for high bleeding risk patients, less is more. Really don't want to slam them with the kitchen sink in terms of antithrombotics, so, so it's helpful in that regard. Well, another trial mentions envisaged TAV AF. I was on the DSMB of that trial. It examined uh, edoxaban versus vitamin K antagonist after TAV in patients that also had atrial fibrillation. And the bottom line is overall, it was a uh, uh, non-inferiority finding. So the edoxaban strategy was non-inferior to essentially a warfarin type strategy. So I think that's good news in general for NOACs. I, point out, you know, however, the bleeding was higher with a doxaban uh, versus a vitamin K antagonist. And, you know, the paper was published in the England Journal of Medicine. The p-values uh, don't get listed for those sort of secondary endpoints, but the confidence intervals weren't crossing unity. So most people would say statistically significant, uh, though, against a doxaban. Uh, so, you know, I'm not 100% uh, sure how that will be integrated, but I think overall it helps add to NOAC data. But at least in the US, I don't know too many folks personally that are using adoxaban as their NOAC of choice. I think most folks will continue to use other NOACs there, but use them preferentially to warfarin. What are you doing in Europe in that situation? TAVI, AFib, are you still using warfarin or are you going with uh, one of the other NOACs, uh, namely apixaban or rivaroxaban or maybe dabigatran? I think the use of uh, NOACs has now caught a lot of ground and apixaban, for instance, in, in our institution is widely used. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that mirrors what the global registry show. Well, the final trial for today, I'll throw back to you to discuss is Figueroa DKD with the agent finerenone, uh, which is a mineral cord, cord uh, receptor antagonist, uh, non-steroidal, so unlike, say, spironolactone. Uh, what did Figueroa DKD do and show? Yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, so this is an MRA, as you pointed out, and we've had previous uh, evidence of benefit of that agent in patients with diabetes and severe CKD. And Figaro is a large trial led by Dr. Pitt and other uh, esteemed colleagues looking at uh, patients with diabetes and uh, a, a broader spectrum of chronic kidney disease. And the bottom line is that this uh, trial shows that finerenone improves cardiovascular outcomes, largely driven by a reduction in hospitalization uh, for heart failure across the entire spectrum of, of these patients. It also improves renal outcomes, by the way. Um, and what's interesting is that um, MRAs are a little like SGLT2s. It seems like every time you test them in cardiovascular disease, they, the outcome seems to be positive. So uh, I think it's an intriguing class. It's probably underused because of the side effects and fear of side effects, both from uh, patients and physicians. 
But I think it's quite uh, uh, striking that these trials continue to be quite positive and show substantial benefit in patients uh, with diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, heart failure, uh, every time they're tested. Yeah, I think what you said is very insightful. I mean, phenarinone is sort of like the SGLT2 inhibitors that every trial seems to be really good, really positive, good secondary endpoints, good subgroup data. So yeah, I think this is something that's going to end up being used quite a bit, in particular by the kidney doctors. I think you know, there for uh, patients with chronic kidney disease, it's going to be uh, rapidly taken up. You know, in heart failure, I think there's also potential. But on the other hand, spironolactone, at least in the U.S., is making real inroads. The registries finally are showing greater uptake of that drug. And the SGLT2 inhibitor is in part based on data from this ESC, but also from prior meetings are also really assuming a dominant role in heart failure. So I'm not sure how Phenarone will fit into that. Uh, probably people will go with the SGLT2 inhibitor, I think, uh, before the phenarinone, in part due to cost issues. But how do you think all that will play out? Well, now we have too many choices. It's, it's, uh, it's a good problem to have. We have so many drugs that are effective. Uh, to me, one of the key issues is, do we go with um, the history of development of these agents and pile them up uh, on, in, the, in the chronological order in which we got the evidence, or do we try to tailor the choice of the first-line therapy agents to the profile of the patients, like SGLT2 is for, more for diabetic patients or, or MRA for chronic kidney disease patients? I, I think it's um, an unanswered question and probably an important question. Yeah, well, that's a great data. Uh, now for these compounds, and I think future trials will have to sort out and real world studies, you know, which drug to use first, what sequence, et cetera, but, but better to have a wealth of choices than none at all. Well, uh, Gabriel, it's always a pleasure speaking with you and to our audience back home, please tune in to acc.org for other coverage. We just picked some of the trials that we thought were really thoughtful and practice changing, but there are other great trials and registries and basic science and all sorts of stuff that we're covering in trial summaries, journal scans, news stories. So please go ahead and tune into acc.org and you'll get a slice of the action of what's going on here at the ESC.